Well, good morning. It's nine o'clock, and I'd like to call the Health and Human Services Committee meeting to order. The first item on the agenda this morning is public comment. If you wish to speak, please come to the podium, state your name, and you may have three minutes. <clears throat> Stephen Rockman, Grand Haven Township. Uh, good morning. On January 30th, Cochrane study was released. Uh, Cochrane Library is a medical database famous for its high quality reviews. The study found that masks do almost nothing to prevent the spread of respiratory diseases. Before the 2020 politically driven COVID hysteria, people, doctors knew this and simply recommended frequent hand washing, no masks, no social distancing. Sadly, Ottawa County DPH went along with the madness, putting residents under house arrest and masking school children. Specifically, the, the Cochrane study found that wearing a mask, surgical or N95, made little to no difference in how many people caught the flu or COVID. Basically, they found that wearing a mask at school or at this meeting is pointless. Yet, Department of Public Health, Learner Lisa Stefanowski, ordered children pre-K through grade six to wear a face mask at school until vaccinated for COVID or given the all clear. We now know, as many knew then, the masks don't protect, but are harmful to social and educational development. National test scores are at their lowest in decades. Michigan MSTEP scores show dramatic declines. Locally, GHEP scores declined. We also have reason to doubt the safety of the shots, given the spike in the number of young people having sudden cardiac arrest. Seems like athletes and newscasters are dropping like flies. Recently, Dr. Martin Kaldorf, an expert in infectious disease outbreaks, testified to a House subcommittee that Forcing children to have vaccines they don't need because they already have the disease undermines trust in vaccines because people know about immunity. I guess we've known about it since 430 BC, the Athenian plague until 2020, and we didn't know about it for three years. To this day, the Department of Public Health under Adeline Hambly continues to promote on its webpage the use of face masks and COVID vaccines. Is she a science denier? So now I hear people attacking Nate Kelly for criticizing mask mandates and social distancing. He was right, but he is somehow a villain. The snobs attack his degrees. These are the same people who have no problem calling Jill Biden a doctor. Even Gretchen Whitmer recently admitted to a CNN host that we had to make some decisions that in retrospect, don't make a lot of sense. You don't say. Now is the opportunity for Ms. Hambly and her partisans to likewise admit Department of Public Health mandates did not make a lot of sense. God bless you. Have a good morning. Thank you. Good morning, Karen Obis, Spring Lake. Feel a little bit like a rebel when I wear this here. You know, as I've sat here in many of these meetings now, I have come away each time grateful I know that sounds odd to some of you, but it's true because I really appreciate being able to hear other people's opinions, which is absolutely what we should be doing and dialoguing and listening to one another. So I'm grateful for that. So it's ironic that as I crafted my thoughts into words this morning before arriving, that one of the things I was going to say was that I am willing to listen to other people's points of view about the COVID pandemic, about public health, department response and all of that. But one of the things I'm still waiting for here, and I'd like to see it first modeled by the leadership in the, in the board and the standing committees, is a way in which we can draw our community together and address concerns we all share, even if we have different opinions about how to affect the cure. And this is just one element of some of the thoughts I've had about these issues in the last few weeks. I think it was after last week's meeting, I went home and I just saw a couple of things cross my newsfeed and both were about maternal and infant mortality rates. And I would guess that everyone in this room is concerned about maternal and infant mortality rates. And we can disagree about the causes for why that increased during the COVID pandemic, but I do hope we can agree that we do need robust healthcare delivery systems, including our public and mental health departments, because pregnancy can be stressful, y'all. 
And it is also really my hope that as a community, as we listen to one another's comments here, that we also try to find common ground and try to find a way to move forward for the flourishing of our whole community. But when I read statistics like the US is the country of all the industrialized nations with the highest maternal uh, mortality rate, there's something wrong and there's gotta be a way we can rally around to cause like diminishing that number. Same thing in Michigan where the 38th in the nation for infant mortality and 30th in the nation for um, maternal mortality. They know that 70% of the pregnant women who died during COVID were not vaccinated. Now it could have been for other reasons, but stats are stats and we can argue about them until the cows come home. But I would really like to see a community like ours rally around an issue we can all agree we need to make progress towards solving. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Harvey Nickel from Jenison. I support you and thank you for fighting for our constitutional freedoms. I have a PhD in biochemistry and taught 45 years at Grand Valley before retiring. I strongly support the hiring of Nate Kelly as director of the Ottawa County Health Department. The local media, especially the Holland Sentinel, keep publishing denigrating articles about Mr. Kelly saying that he's just an HVAC guy and he has no experience work, experience work history in public health. This is entirely false. He has a master's in public health and a master's in occupational safety and health and has completed courses in epidemiology, environmental health, law and ethics in public health, fire protection, technology, safety engineering, toxicology, ergonomics, and industrial hygiene. He has been working as an environmental occupational health and safety specialist for three different companies over the last seven years. He has a personal commitment to lifelong learning and has dedicated the last three years learning microbiology, virology, pathophysiology, organic and inorganic chemistry, psychology, anatomy, community engineering and budgeting, and data extrapolation and interpretation. Public health is a diverse field that focuses on numerous disciplines to promote, protect, and enhance the health and well being of individuals in and out of the workplace, communities, and populations. Some examples of Mr. Kelly's experience or expertise in public health are safe drinking water, wastewater management, identifying, tracking, and controlling communicable disease transmission, identifying and mitigation, mitigating health hazards, disposal of solid waste and hazardous waste according to the RCRA guidelines, monitoring and sampling hazardous air pollutants, testing for PFAS, hazardous chemical procurement, use, storage, and disposal, lab safety and containment protocols, radiation detection and monitoring, emergency planning and management, community relations, communications with local, state, and federal agent, regulatory agencies. Now compare Mr. Kelly's academic training and credentials to those of Lisa Stefanowski, the previous health director. She has a BS in community health education and a master's in education. I suspect that is why she was not able to answer any of my questions about the faulty PCR test that I asked her in June of 2021. Also compare Mr. Kelly's credentials to those of the interim health director. She has a BS in biology and a master's in business administration. In my opinion, there is no comparison. So I so look forward to having a health director who is educated in science and has the critical thinking skills that will allow him to discern between actual science and the unlawful magnate, mandates that have nothing to do with health of our citizens, but everything to do with fear, control, and huge profits for Big Pharma, Bill Gates, and Tony Fauci. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Hi, I'm Kendra Wenzel Hudsonville. Um, I'm kind of piggybacking on what Harvey just said. Um, Nathaniel Kelly has been dragged through the mud of media regarding his statements on the industrial, I'm sorry, his statements at the Industrial Hygienist and Multidisciplinary Summit Support Summit. He stated that social distancing is an ineffective practice for infectious diseases that are primarily spread through the inhalation of aerosols. 
The fact regarding aerosols, which are tiny sublight particles, is that they can remain suspended in the air for long periods of time and can travel much farther than the droplets produced by coughing or sneezing. These aerosols can also accumulate in poorly ventilated spaces, increasing the transmission risk and making social distancing a moot point. Other measures such as proper ventilation and powered air purifying respirators are essential in controlling the spread of aerosolized diseases such as COVID-19. Another misunderstood protocol deemed unsubstantiated in his mentioning of the use of neti pots for nasal lavage. Nasal pharyngeal and oropharyngeal rinses with neutral electrolyzed water prevent COVID-19 in frontline health professionals. A randomized open label controlled trial in a hospital documented here in this NIH biomedical report uh, report, as well as studies shown here in the PubMed report and the MedHelp report. There are also a plethora of other, other documented studies easily searchable. These nasal rinches, rinses can provide relief to people with mild to moderate symptoms. Many studies also report that nasal rinses with saline solutions can help reduce the the nasal cavity's viral load and decrease symptoms, duration and severity in people with COVID-19. This begs the question to me as to why anyone who is reputable would attack someone in this way who has researched proven measures to help with the prevalent illness. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Board of Commissioners. My name is Jeff King, James Allen Township. I'm a precinct delegate for Hudsonville Precinct 1, been living in Ottawa County since 1965. I stand in support of Nate Kelly for uh, Health Administrator for Ottawa County. Nathaniel uh, Nate Kelly is very open in, about being a disabled veteran with PTSD. While some may think revealing that makes him weak and susceptible to scrutiny and the ability to lead, he views this form of vulnerability as a strength. Community mental health is a public health area Mr. Helley can relate to. He recognizes the hesitancies that lead many not to seek the services that are available. For example, he believes in taking mental health services outside of an office environment can increase accessibility, reduce stigma, improve outcomes, and increase engagement. Exploring different options for providing mental health services is important to ensure everyone who needs help can access it. Many people feel uncomfortable going to an office for mental health because of the stigma attached to looking for help with mental health issues. <clears throat> Taking mental health services outside of an office may make people feel more comfortable seeking help and less ashamed. People may be more relaxed and receptive to treatment, which could improve outcomes. For example, group therapy sessions in community settings may feel more welcoming and inclusive. You know how much nicer it is to go into a group where everybody's going through the same thing that you are. It makes you uh, open up more to what's your exact problems. And <clears throat> this could lead to greater participation and engagement with recent approval of the mental health hiring. Mr. Kelly feels that he, he is a perfect opportunity. For, he, this is a perfect opportunity to research more relatable and up-to-date approach, approaches to mental health. Nobody likes to feel like just another number. We have an epidemic of mental health issues of all ages right now. The marketing and outreach aspect could be overhauled to catch up with the times. Brochures are helpful, but we live in an age of video shorts and social media reels and posts that could reach a greater audience who would otherwise not be able to grab a brochure and learn about available services. Furthermore, there is science behind specific patterns and colors that increase mood and focus. For those who prefer a more intimate office visit, the interior design could reflect a more welcoming and comfortable surrounding for the community member, as opposed to a hospital type environment. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, board. Um, I'm Cindy Lorkey from Grand Haven Township. I just wanna say I'm thankful we have a diverse board from varying backgrounds to bring their skills to this board. We have two qualified individuals from the health field, commissioners Cosby and Ebel. When I read one of the board members fake book site posted on February 5th, 2023, that it was worth exploring a bipartisan pandemic panel compiled of health professionals and community leaders, I think of government overreach without accountability. We don't need a panel to do the health department's job. The health department already has qualified people. 
an industrial hygienist, an epidemiologist, a virologist, MDs, nurses, and engineers. The former health department director, Lisa Stefanowski, only had an education degree and she led the medical tyranny onto Ottawa County by following a political agenda. The previous board stood back while the health department trampled on our freedoms and said their hands were tied. Well, a judge said otherwise, the board could have fired her. We don't need a panel doing the job of the health department. I think the health department and our board has all the qualified people they need. When I had COVID, our state health department was calling and texting me daily. They were threatening me to respond and confirm I was quarantining. What's next? A mandate to lock me in my house? Sounds like a communist country, not the principles this nation was founded on. The purpose of the contract with the people of Ottawa County is to hold yourself accountable to the people of those who elected you, rather than the bureaucracy or special interest, which too often sway individuals post-election. This tells you something about a person's convictions and character when within 30 days he renounces his commitment to his voters. It is scary how our medical system has been compromised by big pharma and special interest and the people in the medical field have been threatened and be deplatformed at a time when we need to be able to consider all the evidence to discuss what is the right approach. I fully support Nate Kelly as health director. You have heard from others, his background and his um, credentials. He has two masters that they have said he has managerial and administrative experience in public health, environmental health and occupational health and safety fields. Nate will perform his job without a political agenda. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Sandy Benton from Spring Lake and I'm happy to be here. I'm here for Nate Kelly as well, uh, time and again, as others have stated, the media and other groups use disparaging language against Nathan Kelly. They ignore his military experience and discriminate against him for his HVAC career as if it's not meaningful or relevant. It's never been more important to have that type of career knowledge in the age of biological warfare as uh, COVID is now being shown to be. I recently had the privilege of attending a big pharma conference at Hillsdale which was pretty exciting. And I learned a lot of new information. One of the things I found out was that there's extreme pollution in China and that they actually have their eye on American soil, that it would be easier for them to take out Americans using biological warfare than it would be nuclear warfare because it would preserve the land. The in, uh, and I wanna go back to the response of our, our leaders. Um, the inconsistent and extreme response of our once trusted leaders during the age of COVID has shown us that the science we follow has been merely propaganda. We see it daily during the Twitter hearings in Congress, our own government colluding to censor and manipulate discussion. Rather than use discernment and critical thinking, our health agencies have been known to coerce and pressure repeatedly, making it almost impossible to use trusted therapies like vitamin D and other effective safe medications. We need leaders who understand that the science is actually never settled. And uh, they, the people who understand that bioterrorism is here to stay. Leaders who have the experience, medical knowledge, and level-headedness to navigate these new waters. As a combat veteran, Nathaniel Kelly possesses several qualities that make him an effective leader who can handle adversity and change. He has experience with high-stress situations and has trained to perform under extreme pressure. He has faced life-threatening conditions, including direct live fire engagement, and he has learned to make quick decisions, adapt to changing circumstances, and effectively lead as a team. Combat veterans have been, um, they've had to operate in environments where the situation can change rapidly with high uncertainty. Combat veterans have faced uncertainty um, and adversity and trauma and developed that strength to bounce back from setbacks. They're better equipped to handle difficult situations and lead their team through challenging times. Combat veterans have strong sense of responsibility and commitment to their mission and their team. They're willing uh, to put the needs of others before their own and are committed to achieving the mission. And in combat, collaboration is essential for success. 
Combat veterans have worked closely with their team members and have developed the strong teamwork skills. They know how to motivate and inspire their team and how to work together to achieve a common goal. So as mankind continues to play God with science, biological warfare will continue to be a threat to our nation, state and county. Overall, the experience and skills gained by combat veterans make them excellent leaders Thank who can you. handle adversity and change. Nate Kelly will be perfect for this position. Thank you. Thank you. Darlene Dykstra from um, Georgetown Township. My comments today are meant only to present a common sense overview of the qualifications of Nate Kelly for the Office of Ottawa County Health Administrative, Administrative Health. Mine is not a political stance per se, but an effort to expose the misrepresentation by many that Nate is only an HVAC guy. I would also use this opportunity to expose the ignorance and or laziness of those promoting this false narrative. They are either simply not seeking to understand what his comp comprehensive qualifications are, or they're blatantly and purposefully ignoring it, both of which show a lack of integrity. The qualifications Nate brings to this position are experience in and understanding of the complexities involved in this position. The definition of public health includes a wide variety of characteristics under its umbrella, most of which the general public might not be fully aware, but they are an, integra an integral part. Here is only a short list of the uh, expertise this position demands. It's been spoken to, but... Uh, epidemiology, the study of disease patterns and population risk factors, occupational health, prevention and management of work and work related illnesses and injuries and safe work practices, environmental health, the relationship between environmental factors and their impact on human health, including the quality of the air we breathe and the water we drink and use. Health Services Administration, the design, implementation, evaluation and teaching of health policies, programs and services. Biostatistics, analysis and interpretation of public health data. Public health policy, develop and implement regulations to improve public health and network to develop evidence-based policies that protect and promote public health. So logically, the health officer must be able to assess and recommend actions and procedures for keeping our county safe on a variety of fronts. Doesn't it stand to reason then, by definition, this officer should possess a wide variety of specific and relative education, field training, experience, broad knowledge of environmental practices, and an affinity toward research in those fields and beyond? My sense would also inform me that the ability to, to train and manage a team to respond uh, to detrimental issues affecting our county would be key. Nate is not only a student of these disciplines, has experience in both the US and abroad, but has the experience in teaching it. And you can't teach what you don't know. Lastly, it's been falsely communicated that Nate has no public health experience. Not only does he have that, he has administrative public health experience by managing public health programs. Thank you for this opportunity to more comprehensively explain both the duties of the Ottawa County Administrator as well as how a true assessment of Nate Kelly's qualifications perfectly suits this needs. Thank you. If you can just give me a second before you start the time. I have pots and I get dizzy when I stand up and it's flaring up. So just give me like 10 seconds. Sorry, VA issue. Whew. Okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> Good morning, I'm Kristen Megan Kelly. I'm here this morning as a resident of Ottawa County and a professional in the area of industrial hygiene, environmental and hazardous material management and response and cross-credentialed in public health. As I share some of my direct experiences, is it is with the heart and intent to help Ottawa become aware of potential risk and to prepare for them. The most recent experience I had was in East Palestine. As many of you learned of the accident in East Palestine and wonder what was happening, how did it happen? Where were the experts? And why is it taking so long for someone to help these people? I was able to go directly on site and make note of several things that are important for us in Ottawa County to be aware of and pre to prepare for. First, there was an improper response as well as lack of proper risk communication at the hands of the health department in East Palestine, Ohio. What is our county's preparedness ability to handle the hazardous materials response of that magnitude? Second, risk communication was abandoned and residents were told to shelter in place without guidance, 
but they should have been instructed to shut off their HVAC systems and tape over their vents and windows after being evacuated because they returned to contaminated homes and got sucked into the HVAC systems. My colleague and I were the first to, um, excuse me, my colleague and I were the first to expose the improper sampling that continues to mislead the community because it's not safe. I go into this at length in my affidavit as I am an expert witness in litigation against the Ohio State, Ohio and federal EPA. During the pandemic, I witnessed the Ottawa County Health Department failing to protect this community stakeholders adequately by promoting and mandating a class two medical device that does not seal and have gaps with greater than 9.5% leakage. A leakage of greater than 9% renders them useless, noted by ASTM and 50 years of science. To the best of my own knowledge, Marcia Mansray, an employee of the county and not credentialed in industrial hygiene, provided comment to a hit piece written on me, claiming someone who has tested the efficacy of over 10,000 masks and respirators does not understand the science. This reflects poorly on the department and the county. This behavior is widely out of line when OSHA's own hospital respiratory protection toolkit states, consult an industrial hygienist if you have questions about the level of protection provided, referring to masks and respirators. Hmm. Another experience I would like to share from 2020 is when my four-year-old was denied a school required written, uh, excuse me, vision and hearing test because I kindly disagreed with letting a stranger take her to another area without my presence. The lack of confidence in credentialed and proper duty execution is an issue in the department's leadership and I have many examples. There must be an issue if Commissioner Bonema had to reach out to me for information on two occasions for my professional opinion. Over the weekend, I received a text message from him stating, good morning. May I connect with you today for a few minutes by phone to discuss non-PFOS firefighting foam? I am working on this public safety issue for Ottawa County. I believe this is right in your wheelhouse. I can answer that question. Most green foam is still hazardous to human health and the environment. I recommend Fire Rain Eco Gel, a plant based concentrate that is UL verified for both Class A and B fires and certified through the USDA's BioPreferred program. Regardless of party affiliation, I would have customarily respected a commissioner seeking expert guidance. However, within minutes of texting, Mr. Bonham commented on his commissioner's Facebook page, quote, please be careful. He's not qualified meeting the requirements. This is why Moss and Gibbs have Thank still you. not submitted his application. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Tammy Clark from Grand Haven. I'm an industrial hygienist and occupational, environmental, and health safety professional, OEHS. I own a consulting business with clients in and outside of the state. I looked into the state requirements for a county administrative health officer. The top requirements state you must have an MPH or MSPH degree and three years of full-time public health administrative experience. Nathaniel Kelly has the required degree and experience as administrative experience means service in a management or supervisory role. I fail to see the issues here unless misconduct is involved in the application review process. Ms. Hambly was the environmental health manager and Mr. Kelly is currently an OEHS manager. So what is the concern? Public health administrative experience involves managing and overseeing programs and services promoting and protecting public health. This includes planning and implementing policies and programs, budgeting and financial management, supervision and management of staff and resources, developing partnerships and collaborations with other organizations and stakeholders, monitoring and evaluating the effectiveness of programs, ensuring compliance with regulations and guidelines, providing leadership and guidelines to other professionals, and communicating with the public and other stakeholders about public health issues and initiatives. This administrative experience does not have to be from a government job to be considered public health. It can be gained through private sector experience where individuals manage and supervise these topics in the workplace and how these operations can, can affect or impact the community. Nate was part of a community health board inside Ottawa County, alongside a diverse team tracking total worker health and communicating strategy and policy to ensure manufacturing company processes did not negatively impact our community and our environmental health. There is a substantial lack of comprehension as to what public health encompasses. It is a diverse field that focuses on numerous areas of the discipline, but it seems those claiming he lacks qualifications have not worked in our professions, or they do, but they lack doing so across multiple businesses and industries. OEHS most certainly is a discipline of public health. The most recent display is what is happening in East Palestine. Mr. Kelly first recommended the proper sampling to obtain the closest data to the acute exposure by sampling the HVAC filters. And here is a photo that's been adopted as methodology by sampling teams now on the ground. 
OEHS identifies, tests, and conveys the proper risk to the community and oversees remediation and control efforts. I appreciate Nate Kelly's appointment and hope more people understand his qualifications. It is why I referred him as a guest lecturer at Fair State University where I teach, and he has done so. I have worked with Nate on several projects, including having him peer review documentation and testimony that I have used in litigation and correspondence directly to the CDC and, in our case, at the Supreme Court of the United States. When I started working alongside Nate, I was impressed hearing him recall and explain the DOD best practices adopt, adopted by the military. Thank you. Hello, I'm Cindy Cornolia from Talmadge Township. I'm here to um, support Nathaniel Kelly as Administrative Health Officer of Ottawa County. I'm also here to kind of speak about his education. Um, the Michigan Administrative, um, Administrative Code outlines qualifications for an Administrative Health Officer and they're the following. To have a master degree of public health or science in public health and three years of full-time health administrative experience, or have a related graduate degree and five years of full-time experience, or have a bachelor's degree and eight years of full-time experience. Nate Kelly's credentials exceed those requirements. He has two master degrees, a master of science in public health and a master of science in occupational health from Columbia Southern University. There's been some criticism of Columbia Southern University or CSU to make this easier, um, but I'm here to uh, dispel some of that. Um, if you research um, CSU on LinkedIn and go to their page in the alumni section, you'll see that there's graduates in all different industries, directors and officers, and this includes government positions and, health, and public health and safety departments. Criticism has also been directed to CSU's online programs. Remember John Hopkins, UNC Chapel Hill, Harvard, CMU, and University of Michigan also offer online programs. And the accreditation standards and processes for graduates of online degrees and programs receive the same rigorous level of education and traditional degrees as uh, the um, normal programs. Columbia Southern University uh, on their LinkedIn page, once again, shows that they've been accredited by Distance Education Accrediting Commission, accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, recognized by the U.S. Department of Education and the Council for Higher Education. CSU has received several recognitions and awards for online programs, including being ranked as one of the best online colleges in the nation by bestcolleges.com. They're also recognized as a military-friendly school by the GI Jobs Magazine for several consecutive years. Um, CSU's uh, faculty, they're experienced and have many uh, professional certifications and degrees in their qualified and respective fields. The online program um, with CSU, as in with all other universities and stuff, um, you know, they're for working adults, they're for military members, first responders, homemakers, and those that are bound to their homes and cannot get out to go to a college, um, like some of the kids that are paid, allowed to go to normal um, type uh, programs. So denigrating them is also- Thank you. <laughs> denigrating those people. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? <laughs> All right, hello. I am not here to talk about Nathaniel Kelly. I am your neighbor at 7289 Yorkshire Drive in Hudsonville. My name is Jessica Sifnotis. It's a tough last name, so I'll spell it for you. S as in separation of church and state. I as in I believe in God too. F as in flushing taxpayer money down the toilet. N as in no human is illegal. O as in outbreak preparedness and mitigation. T as in trans people are in real danger. I as in impunity never lasts. And S as in sundown town. Sif notice. Ottawa County, we have a cult problem. 
for the first time in history, I believe. A cult is defined as a relatively small group of people having religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister. Cult leaders usually end up in prison, by the way. This cult shut down a library for refusing to ban books that even mention LGBTQ plus people. This cult tried to refuse free money for mental health care crisis intervention for us, should we need it. This cult immediately dismantled the DEI office, sending a clear message of bigotry and misogyny. This cult has vowed to defund public education. This cult craves public notoriety like a mass shooter with their automatic weapon pointed at our kids. This cult is Ottawa Impact. My family has only lived here for four years. We could easily leave and go somewhere else but I refuse to give in and let my county be destroyed by a small but powerful group rooted in white supremacy. This is my home, Ottawa County, where we still belong. Fellow citizens of Ottawa County, please be an informed voter. Vote common good, not straight ticket. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You all know my name is Dave Barnowski and I vote in Port Sheldon Township. I'll give you credit. I'm taking to calling them the Hallelujah Chorus. You turn out your group very well. Well done. But I am a little bit embarrassed that anybody in this room thinks choosing a health officer or does a public health officer or deciding whether or not a public health officer is qualified to be one should be a subject of public debate. There is no place in public health for the opinion of those who are not professionals in public health. That is my opinion. My other opinion is there's only one person in this room who's qualified to even give opinions about who a public, whether a public health officer is qualified and she already holds the job. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other comments? Okay, seeing none. Next, we have the approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Second. So it's been moved and seconded to approve the agenda. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the agenda, please say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The agenda is approved. So moving on to our consent resolutions, we have one item under our consent agenda, the approval of the proposed minutes from the February 21, 2023 Health and Human Services Committee meetings. Is there a motion to approve the consent resolutions? A motion to approve the consent resolutions. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve the consent resolutions. Um, any discussion on that? Okay, seeing none, all in favor of approving the consent resolutions, please say aye. 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 All opposed say no. The consent items are approved. So as we have no action items for this meeting, that moves us to our committee reports where we'll receive updates from two departments today. So we will begin with community mental health and um, Lynn Doyle. Good morning. Oh, so Apparently <laughs> you shouldn't catch that. <laughs> okay. Um, at community mental health, we continue to be uh, very busy. I wanted to let you know, and I apologize for my voice this morning. I'm not sure what happened, but um, I wanted to say that uh, I appreciate that you uh, authorized the positions and the car recently at one of the board of commissioners meetings. Um, I will be coming to you with some additional, or at least one additional request for positions for the boundary spanners grant. I mentioned that grant at a previous meeting. 
uh, that grant will help us to provide services in the jail for people who are um, leaving and re-entering the community. Uh, today, I thought I would spend some time following up on questions that were asked at this last committee and also at the Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, one of the questions you asked was about our current wages for some of our positions that are difficult to uh, hire. So we did uh, kind of an informal comparison of current wages for bachelor's level case managers and master's level um, social workers and psychologists. What we found when we looked at our peers, so those are other CMHs in our local area, we actually are paying about the same in salaries. Um, for master's level therapists, it ranges about $24 to $31 an hour. For bachelor's level case managers that, uh, or I'm sorry, for master's level therapists, uh, the range is about 27 all the way up to uh, 36 dollars an hour. So having said all that, however, I do know that all of our partners are still having difficulty filling those positions. Um, really, the real issue comes into play when you look at private practices. Um, those are the agencies that uh, some of our staff are moving towards. Um, some of those, if you look at advertisements right now, some of those positions are paying uh, over $100,000 a year for full-time work. Uh, much of that work um, is a combination of in-person, but they're also doing quite a bit of telehealth. Um, so, so folks can kind of name their hours and their work location. And, and really, um, public systems can't compete with six-figure salaries for some of those positions. Um, it was suggested that uh, we look at benefits and, and try to see where we compare with some of our benefits. And that's something I'll spend some time doing. It's a little bit harder to get that information that's not always readily advertised. Um, one of the other things you asked uh, about, um, Commissioner Ebel asked how, how busy we were and what some statistics are as far as how many calls we get and how many people we're serving. Um, just some, some brief statistics on our services for adults with mental illness. Our multidisciplinary teams are currently serving 447 cases. Um, our ACT team, that's a sort of community treatment. It's a real intensive program that actually goes out to people's homes to provide service. We have 47 open cases. Uh, our outpatient contracts are seeing about 216 people at the moment. For adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, that caseload stays pretty stable. It's about 560 people. Our family service team is serving 411 kids with mental illness, developmental disabilities, and autism. Uh, we have 44 kids on our home-based program, which again is a real intensive service where our staff go out into the home to provide services. And we have 230, excuse me, 273 kids uh, being served through our outpatient contractual providers. Our prescribers or psychiatrists and our nurse practitioners um, have current uh, totals of 980 people. Um, between our access center, our crisis team and our SUD, substance use disorder service providers, we get anywhere from 70 to 100 calls a day for new services. Um, I wanted to give you some statistics as well on our Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic, CCBHC grant. So since we uh, started the program, we have 1,017 individuals who have cons consented to participate. Uh, 68 individuals are currently working with our community health workers on that program. 40 individuals are working with a recovery coach. We have medical assistance uh, embedded in all of our multidisciplinary teams for kids and adults with mental illness. So they're serving about 800 plus people. Um, on average, we have about 20 people. That's weird. Uh, about 20 people per class are attending our health education and wellness classes on things like 
diabetes, smoking cessation, oral health, HIV, Hep A and B. Um, we also offer those classes about three to five times a week. Our crisis intervention team since October of 2021 has responded to just over a thousand calls. So we're pretty busy doing things. Um, I, I also wanted to uh, let you know that um, I, I think it is a good idea, the suggestion that um, Administrator Gibbs and others uh, talked about having a grant productivity report, excuse me, um, as part of the budget process. Our grants, um, for those of you who have been involved in grants, know that there is usually quite a bit of um, data collection, data reporting, and status, re status reports associated with grants. So that information is pretty routinely available and something that um, we feel we could easily uh, populate if there was um, a report that was required. We do have quite a few grants and I can understand by all means why people would want a simple way to review what those grants are all about and what their goals and objectives are. So I will leave you with that unless you have questions. Does anyone have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, oh yep. I just want to thank you. Yeah. Thank oh. you for a great report. Thank oh, you. You're welcome. Yes, we appreciate the follow up. Next, we have Adeline Hambly with the Public Health Department. I'll try not to touch the microphone for this time. <laughs> so, um, I have a few updates for you. Uh, first, I wanted to follow up on an item that was from the February meeting. We had talked about um, the website linking and um, process for that. So uh, in December of 2022, uh, uh, Ottawa County Department of Public Health began a process of reviewing over 1,200 PDF documents that were either actively linked on the website or had been um, as they were um, or had been archived as they were previously linked. As of March 13, all of those documents have been reviewed for removal from the website or replacement with new content. Uh, approximately, approximately half of the documents have been earmarked for removal um, and it's uh, ongoing uh, getting that back to web text so they can do that removal. It should be completed soon. Uh, when issues with, the link, uh, with links were originally brought to the attention of the health department in May of 2022, a review was conducted and external sites containing adv advocacy statements were removed. Um, evaluation and redesign of each Ottawa County uh, Department of Public Health page is currently underway. Um, some of it prompted by the review, but also there's a bit of a change for the look, uh, design, I guess, appearance. Um, so that's currently going on and will be implemented through 2023. So I was hoping to have a, a draft communications policy. Uh, however, that is still in um, process. And part of that is um, as we're going through this process, I identified that I'd like to have a little bit more of a structured process for submitting the review and approval for the communications. So we're working, um, that policy is being drafted in conjunction with the creation of like a project management system for our request for communication uh, requests. And so we're using uh, uh, smart sheets to do that and the request will be able to come in and we can assign it and it'll allow us to do some better tracking, I think of time what the request is, the time to create it, and also has some neat functionality for being able to share uh, proofs and drafts and kind of keeping a log of the different communication that goes back and forth. So right now we're in the process of testing that with a smaller cohort of just a few users and um, kind of dialing that in so that the columns make sense. And we're doing the policy and I kind of right alongside it. So, um, the next steps will be to you know edit it based on that feedback and uh, then we'll kind of dial in the everything and roll roll it out and then I'll have it to share. So that was where it got a little delayed. Initially we talked about just kind of drafting a bit more of a clear policy, but it kind of evolved as we worked on it. So that's where we're at with that right now. 
Um, I wanted to let you know the uh, Ottawa County Department of Public Health community testing for COVID-19 will end on Saturday, March 25 in Holland, Thursday, March 30th in Hudsonville. There is a notation on the website. So if there's more information, you can look there. There are free PCR tests available at a test and go kiosk at the Gary Biker Library in Hudsonville. And they kind of look like a, a red box box. Um, so they're, they're kind of, it's outside and available. So they're kind of a neat piece of technology. Um, there are also free at-home test kits available at local libraries in Ottawa County. And so you can find the list of all the libraries that have those if you go online. Uh, one thing that I foresee happening um, on a statewide level that I want on everybody's radar, and as I hear more about it, I'll share it, um, is the movement for a statewide um, septic code, sanitary code. It's been talked about for 20 years in Michigan. Michigan's one of just a few states that have local um, codes only, not a statewide uh, uh, requirements or uh, code for how to design a septic system. And there had been discussions in the past, again, like the last 20 years, but I see it, it's picking up again and with the new um, state uh, legislature, I would foresee that possibly passing. Um, it's something that we would like to participate in. I'll make sure that um, Administrator Gibbs and legals in the loop, uh, because we're a little bit unique with our, with our code is, pretty liberal as we have a lot of um, high water table uh, areas along the lake shore with all the blueberries. And often uh, the codes can be really limiting uh, that are difficult to design around that. So it would potentially impact buildability. Um, so it's something that I'll make sure that everybody stays involved in as that picks up. Um, Accreditation, so uh, the plan of organization draft for accreditation. So I shared a copy with the committee in February um, and the draft would come before the committee for review in April. However, I think it would be beneficial um, to maybe schedule a meeting to review that draft prior to the April meeting and kind of go through the process of what the accreditation process is and um, kind of talk through that uh, plan of organization and answer any questions. So I'm assuming, and I should probably reach out to Commissioner Rohde and Cosby to, you guys can figure out maybe when and who to be at the table. Sure. Okay. Yep. Um, it's, it's kind of, the plan of organization is around 20 pages, but it'd be beneficial just to kind of do an overview of the accreditation process uh, that will be coming in uh, June, I believe. Okay. Um, and good news, I suppose, the uh, last week we had two senior environmental health specialists that were recognized for their skills by the Michigan Environmental Health Association. Uh, Kayla Anderson uh, was awarded the Samuel M. Stevenson Sanitary of the Year Award, which is presented to recognize outstanding service to um, the Michigan Environmental Health Association and the environmental health profession. And then um, Rebecca Folkert was awarded the Distinguished Service Award, uh, which is designated to receive uh, by MIHA for a special recognition of their accomplishments in environmental health. And so I'll share uh, with uh, Minister Gibbs and Shannon a little blurb about what the awards were and there's some information from their nominations, but it's pretty neat to have two Ottawa County people for the state award uh, for when they only give out four awards. So we're next year when we will go for four. So. Um, and then last, I had um, some information and I will email this link because I don't have the print out. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, we have, uh, and I recommend everybody uh, subscribe to it for FDA recalls. There is and I'll, I'll share this, you can see it too. Uh, an FDA recall um, right now for frozen strawberries that were sold at Aldi's and Costco for hepatitis. And so when those come out, just to give you an overview of our process, we keep an eye on those because 
those illnesses get reported to us. And then we can add that to our interview to figure out if somebody might have been exposed to a recalled food item. But uh, also, if it is, we've had, I believe it was a few years ago, a commercial product that had, I think it was actually frozen strawberries, had hepatitis, and but it was a commercial through a board and food service. And then the state will ask us to reach out to all the restaurants that they have on their list that may have received that product, um, excuse me, so that we can go and make sure it's not being used in service. When it's not a restaurant uh, a product, then the MDARD and FDA usually just send out announcements for consumers to check their pantries. However, it's really uh, beneficial some, just to have on your radar and keep an eye on. So um, I'll send the links out so that you can subscribe or not if you're interested. They, you also will get um, recall notices for things like um, dog foods and, and stuff too. It's anything that FDA oversees. Um, but sometimes those calls come into the health department too. So it's beneficial to have that on our radar. So I, I believe that is everything that I have for now on my update list. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question about the blueberries. <laughs> I've got a lot of blueberry fields in my district. Yeah. So you're saying that the um, septic and sanitary codes are going to change to more of a statewide model now that we have new, legis uh, new I'm legislative I'm expecting body. it might. Um, so it's been attempted. I, can, I don't know how many times it's been introduced, but it's been frequent in the, over the past 20 years. And it just hasn't ever gone because counties are pretty protective of wanting to maintain their own code specific to their own soils and, and communities. And it's so varied uh, across the state. Like we do have a lot of sand and high water table, and then you go to the UP and it's all rock, right? So it's very uh, varied among the counties. So part of the challenge is coming up with a statewide code that is applicable everywhere. Do you see this negatively impacting then the farmers? Um, not, not the farmers so much. It'd probably be the developers. However, um, in previous conversations, uh, when this came up five years ago or so, um, it was, uh, instead of having this is probably way too much detail. So stop me if this is not really boring. Usually the old codes would say you have to have two foot minimum to seasonal high water table. And so that would take out all of our blueberries because the water table, the seasonally goes higher than that. Mm -hmm. However, with the last iteration that this came up, it was based more on, you need to make sure your treatment does these things. And that really wouldn't pose much of an issue for us if, as long as it, that language around the treatment and what the treatment does versus soil minimums. It's the, if they go back to kind of the old standard of just a, setting the water table at a certain level is where we'd be negatively impacted, which is why we try to really insert ourselves into that process. Um, and the other thing that, that comes up often with that conversation is our real estate program. So we're one of the few counties in the state that does an inspection on already installed existing systems for functionality. Ours gets triggered anytime the property changes hands mm -hmm. because it's palatable to people. Um, you know, uh, and I believe in past iterations for a state code, it's been suggested for routine inspection, like every five years. And you can imagine how popular that, that would be. So um, we always try to, when we've participated in the past to fight to maintain the real estate at the time of property transfer is the least disruptive, um, best time to do that evaluation rather than a routine every five year cycle or something like that. So those are usually the two big points that we like to be make our stand on, I guess. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, Commissioner Minima. Yep. Commissioner Cosme asked one, asked one of my questions. That was great and great answer. So thank you. Um, Adeline, you had mentioned the FDA recalls and constituents maybe being able to, sub to subscribe. Mm -hmm. Do you have that particular 
way for people to subscribe and what, what is that email or website information? Yes. Um, so it's through gov delivery, but I can say it. Oh, okay. If you search for FDA recall, subs like subscribe, you should get it, but I can email that to everybody and you can, um, feel free to share it too. Okay. So, but it's, it's a gov delivery subscription and I believe you can specify kind of what recalls you're interested in. Um, I tried to look in there, but because I had already subscribed, it, it didn't let me see the full, like what you see when you initially sign up. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Badwell. Daddy, thank you for coming in front of us again today. Um, and thank you for all the hard work on the website. It sounds like that was extensive and mm -hmm. uh, uh, a substantial amount of work put into that. So that was something that meant a lot to me. And I appreciate you following up and giving a solid report on that. So I look forward to seeing what that looks like yeah. and, uh, and continuing to meet with you on that. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about <clears throat> an exchange that we had at the February meeting where I was bringing up the fact that we'd met before. And um, upon asking you and Ms. Stepnoski about reflections over the last two years, if there was anything that uh, you had reflected on that you had learned and that you thought might be worth having additional conversation on. And you brought to my attention the idea of some sort of a response panel, something that was bipartisan, and that would be uh, an, a more effective way to reach uh, the people of Ottawa County. Um, it's been attributed that that my that idea was was mine, and and I think if anybody watches the video from that meeting, they'll see that uh, I clearly stated that that was something that you brought to me with uh, Ms. Stepnoski uh, that you thought had value. And so in that exchange, uh, I asked you upon reflecting more since then. Now we're in February at that point. Uh, is that something that you still believe has value for additional discussion? And you made your case for why you felt like it did have value for more discussion. And so at that point, uh, I thanked you for that. And I asked you and invited you to have a conversation with Administrator Gibbs. And I invited Administrator Gibbs to lead that conversation. So I just wanted to make sure that for those that are, um, you know, asking a lot of questions about that exchange, um, I just would ask them to go back and watch that exchange, watch that uh, uh, video and you'll see what I'm describing as what took place because I don't have all the answers and I don't know if it's a good idea or a terrible idea. What I do know as a leader that I need to encourage conversation, that problems don't get solved unless we continue to talk and work with each other. And I hope that uh, you and Administrator Gibbs will have that conversation uh, if you still believe that that has merit and uh, um, that there's some substance there that needs to be discovered and explored. So wanted to just try to clear the air on that a little bit, but thank you very much. Yeah. And I, to speak to that a little bit, I think um, it got, and it might be a naming um, issue, uh, but it's not necessarily a panel to weigh in on, on a mandate or not. I, I look at it more as like our housing commission or even our food um, coalition or the suicide prevention coalition. It's valuable to have people from multiple different beliefs around the table that can raise the issue from their perspective as one, uh, it can provide a perspective that you may not have considered before, but also it helps you to address holes and gaps that you may not have thought of from your own point of view. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure um, if maybe it's a, a confusion in the, in the nomenclature a bit and when calling it an advisory group, because the advisory group is what our our food uh, our our food uh, group and our suicide prevention are as well, but it's far more of a, a getting multiple pr uh, perspectives around the table to share, so that you're addressing things from not just your point of view. Um, but I have to put some thought into what that might be called. And I'll work with Administrator Gibbs. I'm sure he, he probably has some good ideas as well, since he's got coalition experience in his background too. So, yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. So, 
um, having being done with our committee reports. Uh, this is our second opportunity for public comment. If you wish to speak, please come to the podium, state your name, and you have three minutes. Feeling much better, thanks for asking. Um, I am Kristen Megan Kelly, and out of respect and professionalism, I wanna correct a quote that I made from Commissioner's Facebook page as I had ran out of time. It stated, please be fully aware that Lansing is not likely to approve Nathaniel Kelly due to not meeting the state requirements. This is why Moss and Gibbs have still not submitted his application to the state. But if you read the requirements and you understand, you find that this is demonstrably false. What I need to explain and look you all in the faces is, is I am his wife, but please sidebar that for a moment. No, I've been coming here since 2020 because I am an expert in my field. I served nine years in bioenvironmental engineering, learning cross credentials in public health as part of an IDMT team, independent medical technician. I would be standing here if it were a man or a woman I didn't know, but I took the time to learn. So anyone in the community or are sitting up here that is stating that someone is not in public health, you either haven't worked in this field or you don't understand what it encompasses. So I came here to really convey actually how I met my husband, which was why he was doing food safety inspections in his workplace as a civilian in the Air Force, because he was medically discharged from the military from being hit by a roadside bomb. He found carcinogenic metals in a workplace and people were getting sick and sores in their mouth. That's how I met him. So when I hear people say he does not have public health experience, I'm not coming here to quote white knight my spouse. I'm coming here as a professional who understands the change that we need in this community. And I also feel it's important to convey that the media is doing an absolute disservice because I've seen the Holland Sentinel actually in one token post part of his resume, which by the way, doesn't just fit on two pieces of paper, say that he has no public health experience, but posting the resume that shows public health experience. See, as a community, we need to put apart the partisans, realize I as an ad hoc professional will help anybody, any side of the aisle. I'm an independent. What I will not be, what I will not allow is be used as a pawn as the spouse of the person who was appointed to think that anyone can rip things from the headlines or twist my words. So I focus on also, I do not support a bipartisan panel for a pandemic. I support a multidisciplinary support team, which I was a part of in the city of Chicago and for the federal government for 12 years. And had we had that here in Ottawa County, you have never seen masking because uh, industrial hygienists as experts to exposure control would have showed you that they don't work. We need to increase air exchanges and dilution and destruction technologies, which by the way, I gave the same speech in Oakland County and they called me. So my point is just to reiterate, I wanted to correct the record because that is respectful. I don't ever want to improperly quote someone, but I am not here to cause any division. I am here to, to let you know that there is a broader issue in this county and we need a change and you see it. And I think we can gap the division by doing a better job, maybe a future town hall of explaining what really public health encompasses. So thank you. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Jen Greenlee from Park Township. Not a single vaccine has ever been tested against a true placebo. None. I have two kids that have diabetes type one because of vaccinations. And as you know, the COVID-19 vax was only EUA, authorized only for an emergency. Was the emergency supposed to be for three years? We cannot have people involved with following policies from either CDC or the WHO or NIH or any of those corrupt organizations that have long left their true altruistic motives. We need to have people that are willing to take a fresh look at any policies we've ever had, including PCR tests, including masking, including closing down schools, ruining businesses, following government's overreach and tyranny. We can't have people that will just follow along like sheeple. I have two kids that are dealing with diabetes to this day that have almost died more than once because their blood sugar level goes too low because of whatever the insulin does and because of all these other dynamic factors involved. There's no diabetes in our family. There's no diabetes in a lot of kids' families. As an occupational therapist, I worked with many autistic kids. I couldn't take it anymore because I was at the point where I had to lie to community mental health that they're making progress when they're not. 
They're stuck being autistic because of vaccinations. Do we believe vaccinations are helpful? None, not a one, not even polio, which is what they use as the landmark vaccine. Polio was going out when polio vaccine came in, but we have a lot more hygienic practices and sanitation processes that make the difference. Do we really need vaccines and now they're pushing it on babies? They want to also use remdesivir treatment on babies? How many victims and deaths have we had more from the vaccine than from the bioweaponized flu vaccine that was released from Wuhan, when already before that release, 73 patents for vaccine viruses were already approved. 73 patents for vaccine before China released that bioweaponized flu that did have research with gain of function, despite Fauci's lies and backpedaling. We need somebody like Nathan Kelly that can start fresh. And as he investigates fresh, he's not gonna automatically say, we gotta have PCR tests. We need to start fresh Thank you. and he can do it. Thank you. I'm guessing that's my timer, right? Yes, it is. Thanks. <laughs> <clears throat> Would anyone else like to speak? You know, me again, Harvey Nickel, Livin' Janison. Um, we will never know how many people died of COVID because we have been through the greatest crime in humanity that I can ever imagine. The PCR test has been mentioned quite a few times. It has now been found out that there has never been a true, pure isolate used in the PCR test. That means that there's nothing to refer it to, and it will give a positive test for numerous situations. And the false positive is very, very common for the PCR, especially for the common cold and for the flu. That, and also that explains a little bit why during the pandemic, the flu cases dropped by 97%. And all the positive PCR tests that showed they had COVID, they probably died of the flu, but yet they were labeled as COVID so that the hospitals could get the money that the government was given to the hospitals. Also, I know people, I do not say COVID is not real. It was created. The fear and cleavage site was the point that they put in there to make it infect the humans, to bind to the ACE2 ACE en uh, enzyme to break the, get it to the cell. That is 12 nucleotides that instantly changed in nature. No, it was created. There's a patent on the PCR fusion, furin cleavage site held by Moderna. So they created this. The PCR test also 2.8 billion were sent around the world in 2018. They knew all of this ahead of time. Gates event 201, everything they described in that tabletop pandemic exercise occurred exactly as COVID-19 pan pandemic. The only difference, it was supposed to have been released in 2015, uh, 25. So it came out early, but everything else is the same. Plan the bioweapon, plan the shot bioweapon, and now more people have died from that shot than from any other vaccine through history. Treatment for COVID, according to the Fauci, do nothing, go home, wait till your lips turn blue, then go to the hospital. Never in our life have we had a health treatment that you don't treat until you get sick enough. In the hospital, remdesivir is a treatment. Remdesivir killed over half the people in the Ebola trials. But yet, because Fauci holds a part of the patent, it was the only protocol of the FDA. Now, I still have a printout of the FDA website that has ivermectin as number two treatment. As soon as they could realize that ivermectin was working, they took it off this website because you cannot have an emergency use authorization when there's another cure. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, so. But I, I would like to make a public comment if 
that would be all right. I'd be happy to go over there to make it if I need to do that. Otherwise, I can make sure. it from here. Right. Would you like me to walk over there to make sure. public comment? Yeah. All right. Since there's not another opportunity. Little Paul. Jacob Bonema, 131 South Maple, Zeeland, Michigan. Uh, wanted to make a public comment about uh, the conversations that we've been having today. I think uh, there's a lot of beneficial things that have been said. And uh, one of them that I really keyed on was uh, Kristen Megan Kelly's. And uh, I've really appreciated my conversations with her. We haven't had very many, but we've had a few. And, you know, she is very knowledgeable in her space. And I realized that some of my comments um, were very direct and uh, could be taken as disrespectful to you or your husband. And I just want to publicly apologize because that's not my intent. Um, Mr. Bonham, I, you need to address the board. <laughs> and so I wanted her to know that and hear that. And so I want to take this opportunity to say that, um, you know, when we talked about this uh, response that uh, we could implement in some way, shape or form to improve the future together, Kristen had some really great ideas about how that could be implemented. She said when she heard that, uh, when she was listening live to our uh, February meeting, she was so excited about it that she dropped her laundry in excitement to talk about maybe some things that we could implement and uh, have conversations around this. Uh, you know, I certainly am not for uh, mandates and forcing people to take jabs of substances that they don't agree with and they don't know what's inside. I mean, I'm very much on the record for that. I think we need to protect our individual rights there and I'm absolutely dedicated to doing that. Uh, so this is an emotionally charged subject. I uh, wanted to just be on the record to say um, at no point um, do I intentionally uh, desire to disrespect anybody and uh, certainly didn't mean disrespect to the Kellys at all as we work through this together. I really hope that we can work together I really do, and that we can find some solutions that gives us a, uh, a better uh, experience as we go forward. So that's all, but I uh, just wanted to publicly say that and make sure that the Kellys knew how I felt. Thank you. Thank you. As adjournment is at the call of the chair, I call this meeting adjourned. And we'll come back.